What is happening, Kitoko family? Uh, welcome to today's podcast. My name is Papi Orion, and I'm very, very happy that you are here watching this video. If you are new to this channel, please remember to subscribe so that you can be notified whenever I post a video. If you've been with us along this journey, thank you for sticking around. I'm very grateful and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you, you are still here. Um, today, we are tackling a very, very important topic. And this is a uh, um, Virunga National Park, talking a little bit about um, yeah the rangers around the park and the indigenous people that live around the park. So tune in and yeah, let's go. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge a, a friend of mine, Daria, who actually shot this um, um, this podcast for her for her YouTube channel on a ten ten environmental conflicts taking place right now, and so we were included um, um, in this story and and I was chosen to talk about uh, the Virunga National Park. So thank you to Daria for bringing this issue to light, and so and I thought today why not uh, actually share this. Uh, video with you guys so guys enjoy this is uh, my interview with Doria talking about the Virunga National Park for me personally as a Congolese first as um, I really treasure what we have been given what we have in Congo nature, uh, rainforest, the biodiversity, the flora, such an amazing um, and such a beautiful gift from above that we have been given. And I believe, first of all, this is very unique because first, this is, a, is the oldest national park in Africa, the Virunga National Park. We have it in Congo. The Virunga National Park is considered the jewel of the continent. It lies in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo and was established in 1925. The flora in the Virunga National Park is amazing with almost 85% of animals that don't exist in any other parts in Africa. The second one is the Niragongo, the Niragongo volcano. It's a huge attraction and a huge also blessing for people to come and see. The Niragongo is uh, the biggest lava lake in the world. So, and it's situated there in the Virunga National Park. So, <laughs> and when you talk about uniqueness, already we can see that this is, a, this is this already built some kind of unique environment that, that we have. And then also, we have, uh, the, thirdly, we have the mountain gorillas, uh, the last deposit of mountain gorillas, which in a, in a Virunga National Park, they live in their natural habitat because of the war and because of poverty, the livelihood of, uh, of these gorillas are in danger. Yeah, the first time I visited Virunga, I was also shocked to see the beauty, to see the nature. I was lost in it and couldn't believe that was existing in my own country, my, my next door. Because of that, I, I, I said, man, I need to, to fight for this. I need to tell the whole world that this does exist in Congo. When you look at the uh, rangers in uh, other countries, you know, they're very different to the rangers that you find in Congo. And that is due to the kind of danger that they are exposed to in uh, Virunga National Park. If you know, since 1994, when the FDLR, which was a rebel movement that came from Rwanda, and since they came to Congo in 1994, the collision between armed rebels and the uh, Rangers started. 
We have local negative arms group of Congolese. We have uh, the poachers uh, challenging the, the, the livelihood of the park. The Virunga National Park is surrounded by a poor population. And because of poverty and because of uh, two decades of wars, many militia groups were formed from this population because um, of poverty, they don't have anything to eat, they don't have job. So the only thing they can do is, you know, to start, uh, some of them start poaching, others uh, using uh, resources within the park, logging trees and selling uh, wood uh, to, to multinational companies. There was um, a wall electrocuted fence, which was int- introduced to actually prevent local population from going in, into the parks. So this also created some kind of confusion for the population because they were not sure why they will be prevented from entering the parks. And so, so that they see the rangers in the park, in the national park, as the enemies. What has happened this year, 24th of April, when the rangers were traveling from uh, uh, Rumangabo to, to Goma, they were ambushed by rebels or militia or who knows who. And um, many people were killed in the mix. You know, rangers and just people, just guys that work for, for the national people that I even knew myself that were killed in that attack. Now, um, people, they still don't, don't know what was the what was the motive of this attack and um, the government still probably not have investigated uh, or even offered help to those who were affected one thing i can say is that uh, once there is trouble or some kind of killing or attack in the virunga national park that really created a very bad image for for, for the national parks around it no, no tourists. No one wants to visit those national parks. So, so the choice remains with visiting either Rwanda or Uganda uh, national park. And uh, it is, uh, in fact, part of the battles that we're fighting. As I was talking to my friend, who actually he's a cook in a, in a, in the Virunga National Park, he he told me one thing which I also understood that all these uh, militia they're not actually after tourists. They are after the rangers, the locals, because they are the ones who are attacking them, who, who are preventing them from getting animals or poaching or uh, making, logging the trees, you know, all these kind of uh, abuses that are, are, is happening in the past. Congo is a very hospitable to foreigners, they love foreigners, and uh, it is very sad that these rangers have to suffer the consequences. They're giving their lives every day, you know, protecting uh, um, the livelihood of uh, Virunga National Park. And the 24th of April, unfortunately, many of them lost their lives. And nobody knows exactly who was behind that. The biggest problem is, uh, is that the government, the Congolese government, doesn't really care so much. You know, if the government was very, very involved in taking care of the people or in uh, establishing rules to say, if you are caught poaching, if you are caught, you know, cutting trees or selling stuff, you will be uh, taken to, to prison in Kinshasa. But the government doesn't care because uh, some members of the government are benefiting from what is happening. The previous government, people don't trust so much this government. And people are hoping that this next government, which is in place now, will be a bit different. But as, as far as I know right now, people, uh, they're, they're not seeing so much change right now.
cannot say that I know so much about Soko, but as far as I heard from my friends that are working there and people that know a little bit about the situation, this is a, a company which has given a lot of money to the government. The government doesn't care about the environment, whether they spoil the environment, whether livelihoods of uh, the animals living in a national park, they really don't care. All they care about is how can we get our money, put them in our pocket, and then we okay. And I think uh, Virunga National Park did fight a lot in order to prevent that contract from happening. And because of that, many of them have been killed. You know, their lives are in danger because all these greedy government officials, you know, they really just want to get to that deal. And what I can say with a, a lot of um, multinational companies, they really don't care about Congolese. They don't care about the national park. They care about getting their money and getting out of Congo, whether they spoil everything there. Many of these companies don't care about the environment either. You know, they will pretend as if we care about it, but really, they, they don't care anything about that. From what I heard, the SOCO deal, it hasn't happened yet, but no one knows if, if it's going to be happening in the com coming years or coming months. Most importantly, I think, uh, if anything needs to be done, it has to include the local population educating them about yeah, why is this is important to our generation today, you know, and I think that is not being done in a strong way, in a way that it really educates, it educates the, the entire population. Now slowly people are start realizing that there is something important there, not only for us as Congolese, it is important for, for the whole humanity. It does concern all of us and we also all be involved in what is happening and, and create a greater awareness. The first solution will be creating uh, employment for the citizens and most importantly for the people living around the past, maybe creating um, platforms where you can educate uh, the population. And so the second one will be to educate the children. And most importantly, supporting uh, organizations that are, are, are educating children about the resources that we have. And there is an organization called uh, Congo Tourism Get. And what they do is when they take the, the, the tourists, they take them to the locals as well. And they show them what is happening. So they're sponsoring education and they're taking these children to, to the national park to teach them about gorillas, to teach them about different animals, to teach them about how this is important for them. And you have these kids now, when their father say, I'm going to push, these children are telling the parents, no, don't do that because gorilla deserve to live. Gorilla is important to our, to our life. This is amazing because my friends are doing this. And when I think about it, it just gives me a lot of joy to know that we can actually educate children to grow knowing that I, I will protect uh, the, the national park. I'll be part of making a change in my, my community. I'll be part of teaching those who don't know who, what does this mean to us. Now being able to sponsor such organization and say, we want to make this big, we want to make put it all over the country where uh, we have issues. And I think we will see a generation rising saying that we are part of uh, this greater movement. And I think that will make a big change. The third one will be to say, now here is uh, our rules. Anyone who will be caught, you know, poaching or killing animals or, you know, doing all these bad things will be taken to prison in whatever thing. Like the government is really serious and uh, people will know that our government is serious. Now, what do you see now? They will catch someone who's poaching. The Rungan uh, rangers 
they're not allowed to keep these poachers by by themselves. They will catch someone, send them to the prison, local prison, and then two weeks, a month after the, this person is released. So there is no consequences for those who are doing that. And the government is showing an example, an example that we don't care. You know, we can let these people do whatever they want to do. We will never stop speaking about what is going wrong. And if there is someone who wants to ruin our future or the livelihood, our animals or spoil our environments or misuse our, our resources, we're going to be talking about it until everyone hears about, about it. There is hope in Congo, even though the world and the major uh, media outlet of the world might say that Congo there is no hope. But us as Congolese, we know that there is hope because we were born there. We lived the war and we can see that we came out of that. And we believe that there is hope for, for those who are in Congo. So guys, thank you for watching and uh, remember if you haven't subscribed to subscribe, leave a comment, share this video. I believe together we can create a greater awareness about what is happening, the injustices taking place in the world and most importantly we can continue showing the beauty of our nations uh, to the rest of the world. So thank you for watching and see you next week. God bless.